Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and let's get started again with part two, looking at some of the changes within the liver looking beyond tumors. And I mentioned regenerating nodules uh, very briefly as we finished the part one of this talk. And regenerating nodules, which go by many different names, are one of the real challenges. And we do commonly see them in cirrhotic patients. The issue is, if I look at these three vascular lesions or four vascular lesions in this patient with Bacchiari syndrome, are those hepatomas or regenerating nodules? Obviously, it makes a difference. Regenerating nodules can be small. They typically are small. They can be solitary or they can be multiple. They, they can be very vascular. And even on the venous phase, you can still see them as they wash out. Now, one of the interesting things I found with regenerating nodules is sometimes they're easier to see on delayed phase or venous phase imaging, rather. And the other thing that's interesting is you go from arterial to venous, the lesions sometimes get larger. It's like they expand. Uh, it's interesting because lesions typically do not get larger in the liver. Lesions become isodense with time, or they become uh, the same size, or they become smaller, but they never get larger. The only thing I've ever seen get larger is indeed regenerating nodules. Now, regenerating nodules are a challenge. Sometimes MR can be helpful. You see why it's a challenge. This patient has cirrhosis and there's a one centimeter lesion in the dome of the right lobe of the liver, but that's a hepatoma. With regenerating nodules, we don't see any neovascularity. In this case, you can see the neovascularity feeding this lesion that's seen in the dome of the liver. You also very nicely on these MIP and volume rendered images can see the large varices in the gastric fundus and lower esophagus. Now, it's important to look at the MIP images. With MIP imaging, you don't see a regular vascularity to regenerating nodules, but you do to hepatoma. Now, this is a large hepatoma or a large hepatoma, but look at the neovascularity. Look at the AV shunting. Here's a few more images. So it's very, very important to recognize that often with hepatomas, you're gonna see neovascularity. Uh, if you have a lesion and you're not certain what it is, look at the MIP imaging. That indeed may be very, very helpful to you. Now, um, we talk about, uh, and this article by Chung made the point that more attention should be paid to large nodules in patients with micronodular cirrhosis because of the potential and greater risk of malignancy and small hypotenuating nodules should be followed routinely. So that's not a surprise. Very tiny nodules, chance of them being malignant is smaller but again, it's still a challenge. So sometimes MR can be very helpful. Sometimes follow-up can be helpful. Now, amongst the things we see not uncommonly in the liver, we talk about passive hepatic congestion. Now, since we're all scanning a lot of older patients, and particularly a lot of these Tavar patients, when patients have poor cardiac output, it's not uncommon to see in those cases congested liver due to cardiac disease. Uh, the usual cardiac issue is poor right-sided heart function, but it can be due in other cases to congestive failure, constrictive pericarditis, tricuspid insufficiency, or just simply right heart failure. Cardiac cirrhosis may be irreversible even if cardiac function is improved, so diagnosis is important. What do you see? Well, when you check contrast, it's rare to see contrast going into the hepatic veins. Now, sometimes even in a younger, healthy person, if you have a rapid bolus of contrast, it is possible to see this reflux. But typically, when you start seeing flow into the IVC or hepatic veins, you're talking about right-sided heart failure. You're talking about hepatic congestion. You could see a modeled enhancement pattern due to congestion. You can see hepatomegaly. You can see ascites. You can see periportal edema. Just a beautiful example. Look at the right side of the heart. We only have a little bit of it on this image, but look at the reflux down the IVC and the hepatic veins. Look at the impressive reflux down the patient's hepatic veins. Again, very nicely seen on the various images, and look at it on 3D mapping. There's no other way to get that visualization of the veins then reflux down the IVC. So a very classic case of um, cardiac cirrhosis and uh, changes related to poor cardiac function. Now, another thing in the liver armamentarium of things we need to think about is Bud Chiari syndrome. It's an uncommon syndrome, uncommon condition characterized by obstruction of the hepatic venous outflow tract. Presentation may vary from a completely asymptomatic condition to 
full out liver failure. Bocchiari is an example of post sinusoidal portal hypertension. Just some of the facts. It's also known as hepatic veno occlusive disease. Hepatic venous outflow obstruction may be global or segmental. It may be acute or chronic in nature. And regenerating nodules are very, very common in this patient. So it's very important to look at them. Now, causes membranous obstruction of the hepatic venous outflow tract is the primary cause. Secondary causes due to thrombosis cause due to things like radiation or chemotherapy, hypercoagulability states, or hepatic or extrahepatic tumors. Uh, in terms of inherited hypercoagulability states, there are a number of things, factor V, Leiden mutation, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, and several more beyond there. In terms of acquired hypercoagulability states, myeloproliferative disorders like polycythemia vera, uh, PNH, thrombocytosis, AMM, and myelofibrosis are all choices, including antiphospholipid syndrome and hypoeosinophilic syndrome are just a couple that we can name. With Bud Chiari, about 5% of the cases, it's fulminant, full-out liver failure. Most of the time, it's a subacute or chronic presentation. About 20% of the time, it's acute. So two-thirds of the time, it's a slow presentation. We can divide it and classify it as type 1 limited to the IVC, type 2 limited to the hepatic veins, or type 3 involving both hepatic veins and IVC. In Bud Chiari syndrome, the CT findings, patchy enhancement, especially in the arterial phase, with increased enhancement of the central portion of the liver, kind of this flip-flop phenomena. You can see the large caudate lobe. You can see compressed IVC, the absence of hepatic veins, ascites, as well as regenerating nodules. In the acute phase, you can see early enhancement of the caudate lobe and central portion of the liver around the IVC with decreased enhancement of the rest of the liver. So centrally bright, peripherally is decreased enhancement. And then you see delayed enhancement of the peripheral portions of the liver. And then the central portion of the liver is low density, sort of this flip-flop phenomena. One is bright, the other is low, then the other is bright, the other is low attenuation and narrowed hypodense hepatic veins and IVC with dense walls can be seen. In the chronic phase, non-visualization of IVC and hepatic veins, and nodules or regenerating nodules are indeed going to be very common. Tough to manage Bud Chiari, medically, anticoagulant therapy, surgery would include liver transplant, endovascular therapy would include angioplasty, stent placement, and catheter-directed thrombolysis. Again, um, mixed results. Some examples. Beautiful example of Bud Chiari, prominent enhancing caudate lobe, that central increased density, peripheral decreased density. You go from arterial to venous. Now the periphery is bright. The central is low density. You don't see the hepatic veins. Very nice example of Bud Chiari syndrome. And here again is some more images showing you that flip-flop phenomena and just the perfusion changes. Another case, look at this central bright enhancement in this Bud Chiari syndrome patient, this modeled enhancement pattern, and this patient has multiple nodules. So this is one of those Bud Chiari patients that often have regenerating nodules, which are probably best seen on the venous phase acquisition. Again, just nice imaging of the Bud Chiari with regenerating nodules. You can see right lobe again. And here's an example with multiple, multiple nodules. So with Bud Chiari, you may see multiple, too small to count nodules present, but that's less common. Now, when Bud Chiari is chronic, you may have failure to visualize the IVC or hepatic veins. You may see intrahepatic collateral veins. You'll see heterogeneous liver enhancement with large, avidly enhancing regenerating nodules, potentially. Marked caudate hypertrophy with peripheral atrophy is something we see. And that doesn't take, uh, that can only take a little bit of time to develop, particularly in patients with severe liver disease. Patchy enhancement, good example, TIPS catheter, there's a vascular lesion. What is that? Is that a hepatoma? Is that a regenerating nodule? It's a focal nodule hyperplasia. It is hemangioma. It is tumor. Uh, what could it be? Uh, these were regenerating nodules. Okay. 
let's change topic a bit. And so one of the things I always find is a challenge is things that can look like other things that can mimic pathology. So if I ask you the question, are there anything that are not malignant that can simulate a malignant hepatic tumor? Well, the answer is yes. Liver abscess, sarcoidosis with multiple nodules, an angiomyelipoma of the liver theoretically, infarcts, regenerating nodules, and AV malformations. So let's look at infarcts. The liver blood supply is critical. Liver has two blood supplies. But here's a great example of hepatic infarcts. Most commonly, we will see infarcts post liver transplant surgery, but you can see liver infarcts for a number of different causes, particularly with patients who are showering emboli. But beautiful example of the uh, different wedge-shaped defects. The seen best in venous phase imaging can be solitary or multiple, can involve the diffuse liver. But a very nice example of wedge-shaped peripheral defects consistent with hepatic infarcts. Here's another patient who had a liver transplant, and you can see the hepatic artery rising up the celiac, and within a couple centimeters stopping, and it's occluded, that's why it's stopping. You can get delayed scans. If you doubted that, well, what are we looking at? We're looking at low-density wedge-shaped lesions extending to the left lobe of the liver. This was a very nice example of hepatic infarcts. Okay, hepatic infarcts can be focal, they can be global. They can destroy the entire liver. Sometimes a patient will need a second transplant. So indeed, it's something to really be thinking about, particularly in febrile patients. The importance of IV contrast cannot be overestimated in these scenarios. Another example, here's a great case. Look at the liver, look at the spleen, look at the stomach where it has pneumatosis. This is a post-op patient who now is infarction of the liver. The most common causes for infarction of the liver might be related to surgery, like pancreatic surgery, for example, would be a possibility. And here is the other case, multiple infarcts present within the spleen and within the liver, septic emboli, uh, some type of hypercoagulability state are the two most common causes for that. Now, what about this case? This patient presents with abdominal pain, and the question is, what's going on with the liver? patient has a history of liver disease. You look at the liver and you see there's something going on in the left lobe lateral portion, but then look at the patient's um, proximal small bowel, look at the duodenum, look at his jejunum. You see thickened bowel and you see like a amorphous pattern. You also see the bowel wall thickening. You see what's pneumatosis of the small bowel. This patient ended up with ischemic bowel. Very nice example. What about this case? Two images, patient has an incidental PE, patient's post-liver transplant. What's going on in the left lobe of the liver? Well, that's all air. This patient has infarcted the left lobe of the liver due to injury to the left hepatic artery. Now, you can say, how do I know it's not a normal finding post-op? Well, it isn't. You can have an infarct in the liver, but usually it happens, uh, you know, it has a different maybe history and the appearance. Uh, when you think about air within an abscess, uh, air within an infarct, uh, it's more common to get air within an abscess. Now, in terms of uh, this um, lesion with air, it's maybe a good segue for me to talk about abscesses. We're understanding abscesses better than ever, but we are seeing a reasonable number of abscesses these days. They can be pyogenic, they can be fungal, they can be amoebic. About 90% or so of abscesses are pyogenic, and E. coli is the most common source. Clinical history can make it very helpful, but often the clinical history is just not there, or the patient just feels badly. You can look at this case. This lesion looks cystic, and perhaps you would confuse this with hepatic cyst, but no, you recognize the perfusion changes. This is an abscess which is cystic. That's more common in amoebic abscesses. But when you see perfusion changes around a cystic lesion, you have to assume it's infected. Yes, it could be tumor theoretically, but you gotta be thinking about this being infection. Now, in liver abscesses, just some basic points. More common in the right lobe of the liver. Air fluid level makes the diagnosis straightforward but probably not only is it less than 25, it's probably less than 10% of the time. We talk about a cluster sign of low-density lesions, uh, felt to be multiple, which can be due to uh, abscesses. 
And then we talk about absences being single or multiple. We could talk about categories from pyogenic, which is the most common, to amoebic, parasites, and other etiologies, including uh, bacillary angiomatosis. Abscesses at presentation can be tricky. I saw this case when a patient was found down. I thought seeing nothing else, maybe she had a hepatoma or metastasis. This was by it was an abscess. Abscesses can simulate other processes. So that is indeed very important. You can see a pseudocapsule here. I thought for sure this was going to make it into a hepatoma. This was an E. coli abscess. Very nice example. When we talk about abscesses and pyogenic abscesses, it can be caused by hematogenous spread from the GI tract, ascending cholangitis, superinfection of necrotic tissues. E. coli, again, is number one. And the clinical presentation is fever, right side abdominal pain, and even weight loss, and elevated LFTs. So not the most helpful things at times. With pyogenic abscesses, it can be single or multiple. may involve one portion of the liver or multiple portions. They range from a few millimeters to a few centimeters in size, and rim enhancement may occur. You look at this example, again, cystic, low density. Could this be... An amoebic abscess, I guess you can think about that. In fact, that's what it was. Right lobe of the liver, you got to be thinking amoebic. It doesn't have to be. It could be E. coli. It could be bacterial. But what you're looking at here is a pseudocapsule. And then you look inside and you see multiple what look like satellites. Is this the best example of hydatid disease I've ever seen? The answer is no, but it's okay. Uh, with hydatid disease, often you will find a pseudocapsule. And there was another one from the other week, again, um, cystic, but it's a cluster. So when you see a cluster of things, you have to be really consistent and be thinking about the possibility of abscess. I mentioned a moment ago a case of amoebic abscess. We see it more commonly now because people are traveling. The patients are usually very sick with high fevers. Travel history is critical, but it's something to think about. With amoebic abscesses, you often see a cystic lesion with an enhancing rim. It may have a zone of edema around the border, and the lesions are solitary but can be multiple. Let me also maybe finish up with a couple other comments about infection. Here's a lesion with multiple liver lesions and also splenic lesions. The key here is you can say, well, could this be sarcoid? Could this be TB? You go through a differential. This patient was immunosuppressed, had AML. You have immunosuppressed patients, leukemia, BMT. It's classic to get low-density lesions and then be infection. Now, it's classic also for liver involvement as well as splenic involvement, as well as often renal involvement. So you can see multiple organs involved, so it's important to look very, very carefully. One of the things we also can talk about is sarcoidosis, but I think we'll do is we'll give sarcoid its own send-off and uh, start there in a moment. Be right back. <laughs> 